chapter 33. All right, as I mentioned in chapter 32, 32 is the end of uh, medicine, uh, and here in chapter 33 we're beginning the next section uh, of the class and of the text. Uh, this section covers trauma, and uh, of course trauma I think is what most people think of when they think of EMS, is trauma junkies and blood and guts and gore and, and uh, all that. Um, but uh, we all know after getting into EMS for a while that the majority of our trauma is really not life-threatening. Um, in this chapter, we're going to cover uh, some about trauma systems and how uh, we may fit into the, the whole grand scheme of trauma care. Uh, we're also going to look a little bit at mechanism of injury, um, which we'll cover really more in the next chapter. And then uh, also incident command. And when I say incident command, we're not as much looking at it from the global perspective as we are how do we manage the, the trauma scene um, in the medical side of things. So um, you are supposed to have uh, completed uh, ICS, NIMS, ICS 100 and 700. Um, and if we haven't gotten to that, uh, we'll be posting links in the, uh, the course page for this week so you can uh, go through those modules. Uh, we will have to have documentation that you have successfully completed ICS NIMS 100 and 700 before you are allowed to take the National Registry. So um, if you have those already, uh, great, get copies of them, get them forwarded on to um, us, and we will... Uh, or you can bring them to the next skills day. We'll make sure that we have copies of those in your file that says that you have satisfied those requirements. Um, otherwise, you'll have the opportunity over the next several weeks to, uh, to pick those up. Uh, or if you so choose, um, you could wait until uh, we complete the majority of the, the coursework um, for you to go back and kind of uh, finish those up and, and get documentation to us. As with all of the chapters, um, Simply listening and watching the lecture is no replacement to reading and studying uh, on your own, and uh, I highly recommend that you get that done as soon as possible. We're now switching gear a little bit on the uh, uh, advanced EMT education standard to applying fundamental knowledge to provide basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based on the assessment findings for an acutely injured patient where in the past several weeks it's been acutely, acutely ill, now it's acutely injured. You'll also be able to apply the knowledge and, of operational roles and responsibilities to ensure patient, public, and personnel safety. There are a couple of multimedia slides that can be, or videos that can be watched from the non-narrated PowerPoint. We have uh, several objectives that you'll find on 750 and 753 in your text. We'll skip through those. All right, so introduction. The unintentional injury is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Um, this member, if, if you want to take a moment to, to think way back when uh, to the history of EMS that we covered, oh, somewhere around the third week of class, um, remember that EMS was born out of necessity in 1966 when uh, the white paper was produced that says, hey, there's a lot of people in the United States that are dying on a daily basis and a yearly basis uh, due to them not getting any care. People just coming, throwing them in the back of the, of the hearse or throwing them in the back of a pickup truck and, and running them to the hospital with no medical care whatsoever. So that really was the birth to modern day EMS. By creating organized trauma systems, which was another thing that was started to be developed out of that same paper uh, and, and some subsequent uh, uh, documents that came out, uh, organized trauma systems became the key to reducing trauma morbidity and mortality uh, by providing accessible surgical care for trauma patients. Now, uh, in both Iowa and Nebraska, there's been a large push to categorize all hospitals into some sort of a trauma designation. This can be confusing uh, for some 
people because they don't quite understand what that all means. It basically means the, the amount of resources that that facility has available to care for trauma patients. Most of our local hospitals are probably categorized as level four hospitals. Uh, a couple of the larger um, rural hospitals may earn a level three. Um, and then a majority of the level twos and the level ones are in the largest cities uh, that we have in, in both states. So um, there are not a lot of level ones. A majority of, of the larger trauma centers are actually level twos, but the teaching institutions are the ones that typically will get designation as a level one. Uh, most of this is based off of the amount of resources on hand at any one particular time. Um, so level ones in most cases have neurosurgery available uh, at a moment's notice. Um, and that's one of the biggest things that, that separates them from uh, a level two. So they often have uh, additional physical resources on top of their personnel. So, but, uh, so just because your local community maybe is not served directly by a level one or a level two trauma center doesn't mean that they're not in the system. Uh, the system is designed to, to take people uh, to level threes and fours and have them transported to level ones and twos in an expeditious manner so they can receive the level of care that they probably are going to need. Now, there are always going to be odd situations. Uh, we'll take, uh, an exa for example, maybe a, a service that's uh, 15 to 20 miles from a metro area. Even though they may have a small local hospital 15 to 20 miles out, um, they may not uh, always transport trauma patients there. Again, we go back to this concept of we're going to transport patients to the most appropriate facilities that can provide the care that they need, not to the local facility because it wastes time, it wastes resources. Um, so by transporting patients, maybe bypassing a local hospital and getting that patient into the hands of a trauma center immediately, can really truly make a significant difference because once you show up at one hospital it is not an easy nor quick process to move that patient to the next facility so once they've presented onto the property of one hospital it's very very possible that that person will be stuck in that facility for over an hour at the very earliest before they can be transported onward um, it's not as simple process. There are legal legal and ethical and medical considerations that all have to be uh, considered. So designing trauma systems so patients are going to the most appropriate facility and also being transported via the most appropriate route. Um, some, some services tend to uh, rely on aeromedical support such as helicopters uh, to transport patients the longer uh, longer transports. In reality, many of these services are truly costing their patients time um, and potentially um, leading to side effects because they're sitting with us, this patient uh, waiting on a helicopter where if that patient's trapped and you have to do some extrication and that helicopter can be landing or on the ground by the time the patient truly is free and, and capable of being transported, by all means, that is an appropriate use of, of aeromedical support. If you show up, the patient's been ejected from the car, you simply need to do a basic uh, initial or a primary assessment, roll them onto a backboard, stabilize their ABCs, put them in the truck and go down the road, then uh, EMS is screwing up if they're sitting there with a patient in the back of the ambulance and the wheel's not turning because they're waiting on a helicopter. So in most cases, um, unless there's an extenuating circumstance like an entrapment, a patient can be transported via ground to a facility in nearly the same amount of time, if not less time, than it will take to get a helicopter called, cranked up, flying down there, picking up the patient, transporting the patient back. So, and uh, the staff in helicopters 
really don't do much more, if any more, than paramedical ground ambulances. Trauma systems play a role in injury prevention uh, through community education programs. Uh, trauma systems are not strictly an emergency room. They're not just an ambulance. EMS is not just ambulances and EMTs and paramedics. EMS is a whole system, including dispatchers, including people that are lay responders that maybe have learned CPR or first aid. Um, it's the next level ambulance that may come and tear in. It's the emergency department. And to some degree, it's the uh, extended care parts of the hospital um, that the patient's admitted to, the surgical areas, the rehabilitation. So it's a system. The trauma system is the same way. So um, there are a, a very a variety of ways that institutions actually get named and, and what they actually are. There's a, a hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's called Madonna Rehabilitation Hospital. Well, it, it has the name hospital, and although it is not an acute care hospital, it's not a receiving hospital, it doesn't allow you to come rolling in the door with your patient who has just been ejected from a high-speed uh, high motor vehicle collision. Um, their specialty is rehabilitation. So they work often hand-in-hand -hand with many other institutions, say, out of the Omaha metro area, they may be talking um, the Nebraska Medical Center or Allegiant Creighton, um, Allegiant Creighton, the, officially the Creighton Medical Center, um, or uh, even the Bryan Health System in Lincoln, where Bryan West is the trauma center for the Lincoln area, um, or even Sioux City, where you might be talking places like Mercy. So there's lots of different uh, steps in this whole system. Um, it, it is, and that's why it's called a system. It's, it's not just strictly uh, one unified body. Um, AEMTs must understand and be able to operate within the incident command system. So we aren't the only ones that show up at these emergency scenes. We'll have, we may have fire, we may have a BLS ambulance, we may have a paramedic level ambulance, we may have law enforcement, could have a separate extrication and rescue unit, we may have hazmat, may, may need utilities. I mean, it, some of these incidents can become very, very complicated. And so that's why knowing how kind of the, op, the incident co uh, command system works is, is critical. All right, you think about it goes with your case study. All right, so we have really three E's uh, in injury prevention, uh, and that helps us to provide some strategies for reducing injuries. And, and these are really pretty, uh, pretty standard. Uh, we talk about these uh, and have been talking about them for a long period of time. Those three E's are education, enforcement, and engineering. So when we're looking at some of these things, um, we, we look at how do we, maybe we see an influx of, uh, of, of a certain problem. Um, and so we look at the three E's and uh, how can we prevent injuries? Because we know, uh, in all reality, we know that pre preventing the injury is by far the best bang for the buck. Um, patients do the best if they never suffer the injury to begin with. Uh, and uh, this is why we, we have such a, we, we do have a lot of debate over things such as helmet laws, seatbelt laws and whatnot. You know, oh, you can't tell me what to do. Well, let's, let's look at it. What is it really truly costing our society for people to say, well, this is my right to pick. Um, okay, I get that it's your right to pick. But if it's your right to pick, then it should also be your right to pay. And in reality, people who suffer catastrophic injury, they don't pay. Their insurance doesn't pay. It falls then onto the, the taxpayer. So you have to, to then say, where is the line that we draw in the sand? So when we look at these three injury prevention strategies, we look at things such as education and talking about things such as child safety seats, the benefit of helmets, the benefit of wearing your seatbelt, of not texting and driving even talking on the cell phone and driving, regardless if you have hands-free or not, it is an increased risk scientifically proven. Even if you're using a Bluetooth or hands-free or whatever, you are at a much higher risk of suffering a catastrophic injury 
if you're using a mobile device. But there's also a lot to be said for things such as eating and driving or, or drinking non-alcoholic beverages and driving. It's all distraction. So education has a huge component here. Letting people know, here's what we see. Here is the science. Secondly, we talk about things such as enforcement. Enforcement is when we start seeing things like seatbelt tickets, texting and driving tickets, um, and uh, enforcing all of these things. So with these enforcement activities where we hear the click it or ticket, click it or ticket campaign, they, I think they usually do that in the fall. But the click it or ticket campaigns that you hear about is another, uh, uh, it's a, a form of enforcement. And then engineering. Engineering was another thing that was really kind of ramped up uh, in vehicles, really starting in the 60s, was how do we make these vehicles safer? I mean, those of us that have been around for, some, you know, 40 some odd years, we remember many cars that maybe didn't have shoulder belts. Um, people who have been around longer than 40 years Remember then, there weren't even seat belts always in vehicles. You know, you look at a lot of classic cars and they have a seat belt tucked up against the headliner above the door that if you want to drop it down and use it, great. But it wasn't there. So cars also used to be much bigger, heavier um, uh, pieces of equipment. And that in, in and of itself was a bit of, a, of an engineering feat to protect people. Uh, now cars are created a little differently where they have areas that are supposed to crumple. We also have things like airbags, supplemental restraint systems. So we're seeing more and more great things come out. Things like backup cameras, um, lane change warnings where your car veers into another lane. It starts to uh, alarm you. Hey, pay attention. Um, uh, other crash sensors. Um, we have things like OnStar and whatnot that can play a part in, in detecting a crash and if you're unable to call for assistance it helps locate you so we've got a lot of cool engineering uh, advances that have come into play in the injury prevention and then ultimately the the response we also look at public health uh, public health's approach to injury is to ask who what when where why some to, to some extent uh, how um, to look at these things, to define problems, identify these risks and protective factors, uh, develop prevention strategies, implement, evaluate, and share. So they're going to look at, at um, these areas and, and say, okay, how, what, what is our issue we're seeing? We're seeing a lot of people being hospitalized with um, falls. And we've noted that it's in the uh, over 60 population, and it's the over 60 population who still lives at home. So it helps to identify that. It says, why is this such a problem? Okay, maybe is it because they have older homes that aren't uh, aren't kept up as well because they're not they're living on limited budgets. They they don't have the ability to do some of these repairs on their own. Is it because they have old worn out rugs that don't have the, the rubber backing on it to keep them from slipping? Um, you know, is it that there's clutter? What is it? What's what's the problem? It also then starts to develop prevention strategies. So then it's, it maybe involves us then, and it's and we start to talk up things at our health fairs and our EMS week things, and say, okay, here's how we want to help you prevent from uh, falling. Here's how we want to prevent you from um, drinking and driving, texting and driving, whatever. And sometimes EMS also gets involved with this uh, from the teachable moment. So let's say we respond to a patient's house, patient maybe either do, they can or, or maybe don't even have a traumatic injury, but we, we respond to somebody's house and we walk in the door and we slip a little on the rug. You know, is that something that us as able-bodied people, um, is that something we can take a moment and say, you know, let's, can we look at this? Uh, can we help you with your rug here for a moment? Can we help you secure it or, you know, or, or even give them a suggestion? Can we, can we talk with somebody to get you some, uh, anti-slip backing to put on the back of your rug so you're not going to slip and fall here. And then implementing, evaluating, and sharing, that's then putting our plans into place. You know, there there is a a uh, cousin of EMS uh, that did a heck of a great job with prevention, both 
in between their, their engineering, their enforcement, and their education. They've done a great job of reducing um, catastrophic events in their world, and that's the fire service. Uh, the fire service, uh, through changes in fire code, through changes in materials, and now having more things like, uh, you know, uh, fire retardant uh, materials that are getting used here and there, um, and their fire uh, education and fire prevention activities that they do um, really have honestly uh, drastically cut down the number of catastrophic fires that they respond to. So they don't have a big Main Street burner that burns down half a downtown uh, on a very regular basis. You know, there's always going to be weird, weird circumstances that are going to pop up. But uh, we, we don't have such ridiculously large fires as, anymore as they did 50 or 100 years ago. So uh, the Children Can't Fly campaign um, implemented in the 70s is a good example of, of a public health approach to it. And remember, we're, we're a part of public health. So the uh, New York City Department of Health implemented this program uh, to uh, address the high incidence of death and, and injury from falls from a window. Um, oddly enough, this is something that still happens uh, today even here in the Midwest. Uh, in fact, I had uh, two patients in one day both fall out of a second story window and, and become injured um, not all that long ago. But So it talked about things. They passed laws such as window guards. Um, they raised uh, people's awareness to this was becoming a, a very big issue. Uh, they were looking at uh, other reporting systems that required uh, injuries to be reported so there could be better monitoring, better surveillance and tracking. Uh, created some assistance in making safer environments and in turn uh, saw a fall related injury decline of more than 50 percent and which is fantastic. I think uh, you know it, it would be great if it was a hundred percent but to, to cut it in half the number of injuries that you had uh, was, was remarkable uh, particularly for a city the size of New York. Okay, so it's easier to educate people on how to prevent from becoming injured than it is to treat the following injury. Because, you know, we, we take an hour to, to talk to somebody about fall prevention. Uh, if they don't fall, great. That one hour investment that we had um, by far was more cost effective and, and better in the long run than the nine months of physical therapy and inpatient therapy and care and possible lifetime of uh, debilitation that could come from somebody actually having a, a, a significant fall. And that goal of in injury prevention is to change the knowledge, the attitudes, and the behaviors in, of individuals in society. We are never going to sway 100% of the people 100% of the time. Um, you know, there are always going to be what ifs. And, and I, I've heard this for decades, uh, the decades of my career. Well, you know, I know so-and-so who was in a car crash, and they had their seatbelt on, and they died. So you cannot tell me that seatbelts save lives. Well, that's just an ignorant approach. Um, we can definitely tell you that seatbelts save lives, but there's always going to be what-ifs. We can always second-guess it. You know, there's always going to be occasions in which it doesn't follow the trend. You know, the, the brain bucket issue with people wearing their, their brain buckets on their bicycles and their motorcycles. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, if I just save my head, uh, then, you know, I, I'm still going to be a vegetable. Just uh, I'll be aware of being a vegetable. And we know that, that in most cases... It's the head, the chest, and the abdomen that kills you. Um, and the head is probably the most vulnerable when you're out there on the open road. Yes, there's always going to be things that happen. But we're trying to make people better aware. And sometimes our statistics do great things, and they'll show people, hey, look, we've seen a 50% reduction. We've seen a 75% reduction. But there are always going to be those people that naysay it. So a trauma system are the components and services 
to provide the definitive care for patients with serious injuries. We aren't the trauma system. We're a piece in the puzzle. We are, ourselves are not the trauma system. Remember, in the acute phase of a traumatic injury, we're just a vehicle. We're, we're a way to get them from the scene to the surgeon. And that's what most trauma patients need is a surgeon. So sometimes they need it more expeditiously than they do with others. So if somebody who's fall down breaks an arm, that's technically a trauma patient. Do they need a surgeon immediately? In most cases, they don't. In most cases, um, they probably need um, evaluation by a, a local physician, potentially an orthopedist. But then there always could be those things in which that person's lacerated an artery or has impinged on a nerve and has now has neurovascular compromise in their extremity. And in those cases, um, they have to step up. That the game has to to uh, to progress. So we have other various components here, such as leadership. Somebody who is going to organize and support and, in some cases, uh, make rulings on our system. So there needs to be a lead agency. And in many cases, um, when we're talking about leadership in trauma systems, um, yes, the government does have some involvement in that. But in many cases, it's a council, you know, where they're involving some some representation from EM, from pre-hospital EMS, some representation from uh, the consumer, some representation of the ho of the smaller hospitals, some of the larger hospitals, tra trauma surgeons, nursing, uh, rehab. So, in often often uh, we see these councils or this. Uh, you know, kind of a, a uh, stakeholders group that is is in charge of kind of defining and leading the system. Uh, professional resources. So we have to have people who know their respective roles. So whether that's physicians or nurses, um, maybe it's even including the other ancillaries such as uh, radiology and laboratory. Maybe it's mid-level providers like physician assistants and nurse practitioners, um, engineers, highway uh, people, highway traffic safety administration, uh, representatives of pre-hospital care. So we have to have those representatives, those resources uh, in the system as well. So if we continue to lose physicians and nurses on uh, almost an alarming rate um, as America grays and ages, uh, that, that potentially removes some of those resources from our communities. The one thing about EMS, EMS is the only health care provider that is in every community in the United States. So there is not a nursing home or a doctor's office or a hospital or a clinic in every town, but every town is served by EMS in some way, shape, or form. Education and advocacy. So whether that's educating the general public, letting the general public know, here's how our system works, here's some, some tips on prevention. We also have to have professional education. So with professional education, can we advance our skill set? So as an advanced EMT, once you're certified and ready to roll, you may choose to take an additional course to expand your horizons in trauma. So you may take a course called ITLS, International Trauma Life Support, or PHTLS, which is Pre-Hospital Trauma Life Support. Both of them are geared towards pre-hospital setting. But these are our courses that are roughly 8 to, to 20 hours, depending on uh, how advanced of a course you take and whatnot, that you can get additional education, theory, uh, practice in treating trauma patients. Nurses have a similar course that, that they go through, and, and their course is called TNCC, which is the Trauma Nurse Core course. Physicians go through a course called, and, and mid-levels, go through a course called ATLS, which is Advanced Trauma Life Support. Um, and it's all geared towards uh, improving awareness uh, and improving 
education and skill sets in uh, trauma care. Uh, interestingly enough, um, most of these courses, the, the TNCCs and the PHTLSs and ITLSs and whatnot, came out of the ATLS course that I mentioned that physicians and mid-levels mid take. And uh, the whole push for that actually came out of the state of Nebraska when a trauma surgeon uh, was flying his family across the state, had a, had a plane crash, and his, his, he was a, a metro area trauma surgeon that um, his family was then taken to a local, uh, very small hospital, uh, and, the, and the hospital was ill-prepared to deal with such traumatic injuries. And that was kind of the, uh, the spark that started this push that we have better education for everybody uh, throughout uh, the state or throughout the United States for that matter. We also have things such as information management. So states now have trauma registries, both Iowa and Nebraska do, um, and that trauma registry collects data um, and collects that data and says, helps us identify when and where and why and how, um, and it helps identify outcomes as well. So it allows us to see when we are we seeing traumatic injuries, from what circumstances, how are they being treated, and how is their outcome? Do we see better outcomes in certain places? Finances. Somebody's got to pay for it. And trauma care is big business. It doesn't create a lot of money. Because, like I said, most people who have a catastrophic traumatic injury, um, they're not going to end up paying for it in the long run. Many of these people will uh, eclipse their amount of insurance coverage, and if they, we're talking about catastrophic now, um, eclipse their amount of uh, insurance coverage, and then uh, move on uh, and have to go on to uh, state assistance or federal assistance uh, to continue to pay for this. So um, the funding of trauma systems is becoming bigger and bigger deal, and uh, state and federal agencies are looking at better ways to make sure that it is funded so that hospitals have the, the funds and the resources that they need to provide trauma care. Research. Just as I said that we have information management, uh, we have research. Uh, there are places, uh, particularly one institution is referred to as NEMSIS, N-E-M-S-I-S. -S. Uh, NEMSIS is located um, at the University of Utah, um, and they take this data that's been collected via, you know, whatever our resources are, whether we're filling out our, our uh, in Nebraska we call it the Narciss form, uh, but our uh, can be you know whatever method you're using in Iowa, uh, Med Media or Firehouse or whatever, but uh, that takes that data, transmits the data uh, on a regular basis to Nemsis from the state, and then Nemsis can then start looking, watching, interpreting the data that they're seeing. Are, are they seeing that people who are starting lactated ringers IVs are doing are having much better results with their patient outcomes than people who do normal saline IVs? I don't think that that's actually true, but uh, that would be an example. And then technology. So technology, we're, we're blessed to live in the age that we, we do because technology is just growing uh, by leaps and bounds. We're seeing all kinds of, of new great things popping up. GPS systems and automatic crash notifications that automatically pages 911. We have next generation 911 uh, coming around in which You'll be able to call 911 from your cell phone and you know, won't even have to say a word and they'll be able to pinpoint you within about six feet of where you lie. So um, we're also looking at things such as in larger systems, they do something called system status management. And in system status management, um, they're relying on all the statistical data that they've gathered from years and years and years and running all kinds of advanced formulas to kind of help determine staffing levels. You know, do we need to have 10 ambulances on during the day but only need seven ambulances on at night? It also helps look at where do we position them? You know, do we want to keep them in, in stations? Um, or do we want to move them around? 
maybe we want to say, okay, well, if uh, you know, ambulance three goes out, we're going to move ambulance two and ambulance four a little bit to help cover ambulance three's district or their territory. Um, so these, these ambulances may constantly be in a state of moving from one spot to another uh, to optimize their responsibilities. All right, and obviously hospitals are part of the trauma system, and they have a specific trauma center designation. So it kind of goes on to talk a little bit in the, there's a, a box just like this on 755 in your text uh, that talks the difference between levels 1 through 4, um, and uh, the names may change a little bit from state to state but uh, a level one generally means, and this is out of the American College of Surgeons, capable of managing any type of traumatic injury 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We're a level two area trauma center, capable of managing most traumatic injuries 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, capable of stabilizing trauma patients in trans, um, that cannot be managed by them and transferring them to level ones. Level three, they have some immediate surgical capabilities and specialty train, uh, trained ED staff to manage trauma, but they focus on stabilization and transferring to a higher level center. And a level four, these are the smaller hospitals located in the remote areas uh, that are capable of stabilizing them, probably not surgically though, and moving them on to a higher level center. So why are we so important in this whole process? Remember, we're the only ones that actually see the scene. Um, as EMS professionals, we make that initial contact. We do the initial scene size up, and we start to, to make um, uh, interpretations and, and uh, judgments based off of what we do see. And uh, we provide triage and then emergency treatment and transport. We don't always take all of our patients to the same facility. You know, if we would say something like we have a, a, an explosion, um, there's a good example that happened, I guess, a couple weeks ago in Omaha where there was an explosion and a building collapse uh, in an industrial setting in which patients were transported to at least three different facilities um, during that incident. The most severe of those went to the, on, to the trauma center of the day uh, in Omaha. Um, the next couple of, of severe patients went to the uh, off trauma center of the day. And if you're not familiar with Omaha's trauma center system, they actually, Creighton University Medical Center and the Nebraska, uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center take turns. They switch off um, bas basically every other day. Uh, it's not quite true, but basically in an every other day rotation that uh, one of them is the, the designated trauma center for the day. Um, so the, the one that wasn't the designated trauma center of the day got the next you know, number of uh, not so severe patients. And then uh, the third hospital that received them was a, was a close by, um, not trauma hospital, yet it was one of the most more advanced non-trauma hospitals in, in the metro. All right. So we make some decisions. We're empowered to make decisions. Sometimes we have to make that choice to say who's going where. All right, so multiple casualty incidents. I think most of the most of us are probably not terribly fond of responding to these large scale incidents where we've got lots and lots of people. It ends up being very confusing. Usually, lots of lots of uh, um, headaches and heartaches go along with it. But uh, these multiple casualty incidents, MCIs, are those in which the number of patients exceeds the capabilities of the resources on scene. So technically, a multiple casualty incident in most systems would be if we have more than two patients. Because an ambulance uh, generally is capable of transporting two real patients. Now, if we're talking about somebody who's, you know, got a stubbed toe in, in the process, um, you know, we could probably transport that third person, but in most cases, an MCI is more than two patients. Now, you show up, if you have a crew of two people that shows up, and we have two critically, critically injured people, um, even 
two people could potentially be considered a mass casualty incident because it uses up all the resources we have. Now granted, we may be able to grab somebody off of a fire truck to drive or a law enforcement officer to drive, um, but maybe you're working in a system where you're an advanced EMT and your partner is uh, a licensed driver. Um, in that case, you have an MCI with two patients. So some events that maybe would qualify, they list a number of these in your textbook. Um, school bus crash, plane crash, passenger train derailment, mass shootings, explosions, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of it also depends on the system. Now, if, if we kind of look around the area, kind of say, okay, what are, what are all of these, what are we capable of handling? Many small towns have one ambulance. They maybe have a backup ambulance, so maybe two if they're lucky. Um, and, and a lot of it depends on the population, depends on the, the support for that department. So one or two, so we could potentially say five, a five patient MCI um, really becomes a big deal because now we're relying on other entities to have to come in and assist with this. So mutual aid gets, gets used quite a bit. We might be looking at something like the city of Omaha, and, and I don't know for, for sure, uh, but I believe uh, Omaha typically has somewhere between around uh, 12 to 13 ambulances uh, staffed at one time. Uh, they don't usually have a rolling staffing pattern. It's usually pretty, uh, pretty set, um, but so somewhere 12, 13, maybe 14 um, ambulances. Uh, the city of Council Bluffs, Iowa, just across the river, they have uh, three generally staffed ambulances. Now they have, most of these departments also have extra trucks. And it's a matter of, of throwing a few people into an extra truck um, as need be. Uh, or you might have a system, say like, uh, well, the Papillion La Vista system that's, that's fixing to come about. They have four stations. I believe they're going to staff uh, three ambulances, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, Bellevue, they usually have uh, two and two or three and two, something like that. Uh, so it, it all depends. You might be talking something like, I, I have no idea how many ambulances would be on duty at one time in, in New York City. So you can talk that, oh, wow, that, you know, that, that doesn't really seem like a lot to say that, you know, the Omaha metro area is 500, 600, 700,000 people in it. You know, we're probably talking 20, 25 ambulances between all the different cities. But then you also start to look at other things like, is there private uh, private ambulances in those various communities as well, in which the city of Omaha has really three uh, major private ambulance companies that, while they don't primarily respond to 911, they're licensed uh, just like any other ambulance. Their, their staff is trained just like any 911 uh, provider would be. So uh, that actually becomes a bonus. Oh, but yeah, we also have helicopters. We have a couple of helicopters in the metro area. Okay, so now we're kind of expanding and expanding and expanding. Um, and maybe we have like the Medical Reserve Corps or in the Lincoln area where you have a um, military ambulance unit. So, and, and not to mention, you know, the uh, Air Force Base in the Omaha metro area has, has ambulances as well. So, as we start to kind of really look a little deeper and, and unpeel some of these layers off, uh, it can help us better define. And the point I'm trying to make is that each system is going to be different and they're going to have to know what are our expectations. So some rules for managing multiple gas dances. Number one, request additional resources early. If you get your hands dirty, your chances of actually stopping put on gloves, to call for additional resources, whatever, uh, greatly reduces. So if you pull up on scene and you're like, holy crap, uh, that's the time in order to start requesting additional resources. You can always turn them around. Properly staging vehicles. So if we have an incident that has closed down several city blocks, um, if we have vehicles funneling in one way, and it just so happens that there's only one way in and out, uh, we quickly bottleneck these. So properly staging the vehicles, maybe it's those extra resources that we called for that we weren't 100% sure that we needed, 
we tell them to stop a few blocks away and wait for further instruction. Place triage and treatment areas. Those are our babies in the mass casualty incident. Triage, treatment, and transport are our babies. So we're the ones that, that are going to oversee sorting patients, beginning treatment, and getting them moved to the appropriate facilities. So we provide that care and transport of the patients uh, in an efficient manner. It may not be to the fullest extent of our capabilities because we'll take, we take for example, the, uh, the debate that comes up is, well, this is a mass casualty incident. I had to triage patients. Uh, this patient has no pulse and no breathing, so I'm going to start CPR on them. Well, we already have limited resources. Working a full code is going to take at least three people in order to run a full code. Somebody's going to have to do some compressions. Somebody's going to have to, be, have to be doing other things like airway and IVs and drugs, whatever. Somebody's going to have to drive. So, and the amount of resources, the cardiac monitor and the backboard and the oxygen and the, the drugs and the IVs and the this and that and the other thing for somebody that we know has a 3% chance of surviving. So we have to look at the, that concept of triage, and the concept of triage is really truly doing the best for the most. So if we have a person who is got some critical injuries but still has a pulse, still has some breathing, their chance of, sur of survival is much better than that person who doesn't have a pulse, doesn't have breathing, now that we're going to take all these resources out uh, in order to uh, to concentrate them on a person that has very little chance of living anyway. And then learning, of course, how to prioritize patients, triage them, and then treat them. So an MCI uh, in any event where the number of patients exceeds our capabilities and in a relatively small community with very limited resources um, may not necessarily be an MCI in a larger city, uh, where the resources are more abundant. So if we have you know, a two-vehicle collision that has five people injured, um, five people injured in a small community that maybe has, at best, two ambulances, that's an MCI. In the metro, that's just two stations, two out of 30 stations. So um, it's not an MCI. Communication, probably the biggest problem with multiple casualty incidents is communication. We need to be able to respond, uh, uh, to communicate with each other. Radios and cell phone communication may be affected. So let's say uh, we have a, an incident which has targeted some uh, cell towers, and that takes out that capability. Maybe it, it's wiped out our main base station. Uh, so we can have things that are going to be affected. We, ha we have those backup plans. We probably have a radio. We may have um, some uh, cell phones. Of course, people probably carry their own cell phones as well. Normal communication may not be, may be non-existent. We may not be calling in. And in most of our ambulance calls, we call every time we do anything with the patient. So we're transporting. You know, we got the call. Uh, we're out to the station. We're at the station. We're leaving the station. We're at the scene. We're at the patient's side. We've loaded the patient up. We're transporting the patient. We're at the hospital. We're clear at the hospital. Now we're leaving the hospital. Now we're back at the station, and so on and so forth. We may not be doing that in multiple casualty incidents. Uh, you may be responsible for keeping track of your basic times yourself, simply for the fact that if we tried to have 50 ambulances all trying to do the same thing, um, it would uh, it would way way overwhelm the communication system. You know, uh, when we're looking at things like comm centers. There is a limited number of terminals in which dispatchers can sit down at. Use of portable radio, satellite phones, self-contained mobile command centers, portable repeaters, that may be something that you're looking at uh, for your system. How are we going to do this? Well, usually this is done on a, say, a county-wide level or a multi-county region. People are saying, okay, how can we share resources? Because it does not make sense for every single agency to have every single piece of equipment under the sun. You know, if you live in a town of 300 people that has 10 calls a year, it does not make sense for your small town fire department to 
to have an aerial ladder truck that reaches a height of 120 feet, uh, you know, and pumps 2,000 gallons of water on a minute. Uh, your 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 resources in your your town may not even be able to handle it. You may not have a hydrant system that can handle that. You may not have any buildings that is 120 feet high. So it doesn't make sense for every town, every even every station to have all of the resources. So we strategically place resources around so if we need them, they can get to us in a fairly uh, expeditious uh, and efficient manner. So maybe the county has a hazmat system where there's a trailer that has extra backboards and has a portable radios and has med kits and has oxygen bottles and you know it has triage tarps and, and all this other stuff. And as an incident unfolds, they call that call the county early and say, roll our, our incident uh, system. So maybe a couple of counties have, have teamed up. You know, it, it's expensive business to have toys. One of the most vital aspects in successfully managing MCI is the ability to communicate. So knowing how that's that system going to work. Uh, I think if you can recall, we went way back uh, to the early parts of, of the course. I talked about things such as 10 codes. 10 codes have almost all completely died. Um, they, they went away because we saw things happen where um, a jurisdictional change meant that a 10 code meant something completely different. Um, whereas in Nebraska, early in my career, we were going on a 1045, meant we were going on a personal injury collision. But if we drove across the Missouri River into Iowa, if we said we were responding to a 1045, it meant we were responding to an animal carcass laying in the road uh, because that was a difference in 10 codes from one state to another. So it, it doesn't, remember things don't translate well. Uh, the, larger the, the larger the incident, the more systems you're going to have, the greater chance of confusion. Even saying transporting code 3 or code 1 um, if you transport code one in the uh, Nebraska and Iowa, most, most of Nebraska and Iowa transporting code one, you're transporting nice, easy, safe, uh, slow, no lights, no sirens uh, um, mode into the hospital. There are other places, say in Missouri and Kansas, that code one means highest priority, lights and sirens. So being able to communicate is critical in knowing how do we, how do we clarify the confusions. Um, and then on arrival, the scene will most likely be very chaotic, making communication between responders even more important. This is why we have these incident management systems, these incident command systems, that very few people actually do much talking over the radios, um, and most of the information gets funneled uh, from a particular area to a command person uh, or, or a supervisor. Uh, that is then going to make a, a lot of uh, pass on a lot of information. So you're probably not. If you're the 19th ambulance to show up on this scene, you're probably not ever going to talk to the incident commander. You may not even talk to the treatment command or the triage command uh, or the transport command. Um, you may talk to somebody else that's a couple steps down the, down the rungs here, simply for the fact that uh, that's an an attempt to make an orderly um, attack on the situation. So NIMS. NIMS is the National Incident Management System. Um, it's designed for use by all agencies during a disaster. By law, by federal law, all fire, EMS, and law enforcement personnel are supposed to be trained in the basic NIMS and ICS, which ICS is Incident Command System, are supposed to be trained in those basic uh, courses of NIMS and ICS. Uh, the reasoning for this is so, so we have interoperability between agencies. So everybody's on the same sheet of, sheet of music when we start the incident. Now, the, the, depending on your position of responsibility within the agency, you may have to take more courses in higher levels of NIMS and ICS. But if your department wants to apply for grants from FEMA to buy a new fire station, a new tr 
truck, a new whatever, um, there's a good chance that they're going to have to prove X amount of their people are trained in NIMS and ICS, 100, 200, 700, 800, what have you. So compliance requires all responders to obtain certification in basic ICS, and organizations must, partain, must participate in disaster drills. So organizations have to work together in disaster drills in order to try, all this, try this out and then find where are we weak and what can we do to improve. All right, so all agencies that may be called to respond to a disaster must become NIMS compliant. So all responders must obtain certification in basic ICS. As an advanced EMT, you must obtain certification so your organization remains in compliance. You may have already done this. You may have done this 10 years ago. You may have done this back in, you know, well, probably not 2001, but 2002, I think, is when they really started to roll those courses out. And, and have been so ever since. Some of you, this may be all completely brand new to you. Um, you can take these classes in person. Many of them are also offered online. You can sit down, go through the uh, online presentations, take a quiz, and, and then they give you a, they send you a certificate that you can print off and that goes into your file. Um, the new ed national education standards enforce this. So it says, if you don't have this, you have to have this before you can test, uh, take the registry for the next time. So, so if you've been an EMT for 30 years, never done ICS and NIMS, now you're going to go on to test at the advanced EMT level, there's going to have to be that proof. And so that's why we, we bring it up. So a basic ICS organization uh, for EMS operations, we have an incident commander. In many cases, an incident commander is probably a fire chief. Um, people will debate this and say, well, yes, the fire chief by law is the one in charge of that scene. Well, to an extent, that is correct. But there is also um, other laws that uh, uh, actually uh, contradict that. So a lot of it depends on the nature. Um, and the, the recommendation is that a unified command system gets used. So you maybe have somebody that's overseeing the law enforcement side. You may have somebody overseeing the fire side. And you may have somebody overseeing the uh, EMS side. So in this case, we have an incident commander, may or may not be a fire chief, may be the EMS uh, person. Um, and in many cases, uh, it's, it's the first emergency responder to arrive, assumes incident command until somebody else comes and relieves them. So then we have an operations section chief, which is most likely going to be the highest officer that really actually is in the EMS world. Um, and that operations section officer is going to oversee parts of, such as triage, which is an EMS function, treatment, which is an EMS function, and transport, which is an EMS function. Now, in incident command, we typically ha look at it from the five sections, which is referred to as the CFLOP approach. And the CFLOP approach is command. So really that's the incident commander, whoever's really overseeing or in charge of this incident. Whether or not that is a unified command or a, um, uh, a single incident commander, that depends. We have the finance and administration. Somebody's going to have to track all these things that are going on. Uh, eventually there is going to be reimbursement available to the various uh, uh, organizations. So that's something they're going to oversee logistics. We need stuff in order to manage this incident. That's what logistics does. They look for the, they get the toys. Operations. This is usually the, the EMS side of things in which we're you know, actually doing emergency medical treatment transport assessment. And then planning. Um, what are we going to do to improve this in the future? What are we going to do to improve this even in, in an hour from now? So to look a little bit deeper at some of these things, we look at command. Command is uh, the most important section of ICS. Somebody's in charge. They're the incident commander. Um, uh, 
the individual responsible for the coordination of the entire response. So if there becomes, you know, let's say finance and logistics have an issue, you know, logistics says we need this, we need this, we need this, and finance says we can't, we can't, we can't, uh, it's the incident commander that's probably going to have to come in and kind of make a, uh, a ruling on this. Now that command may be singular or may be unified, so singular, smaller scale incident, um, and, and it's very possible that one agency is going to assume command. It's all basically kind of a, an in-agency uh, in response. We may have that unified command, uh, so it's a very complex system, very complex scene. Maybe we have, maybe it's a mass casualty incident, but we have things like fire, and we have things like cave-in, and we have, um, you know, maybe it's a criminal, uh, you know, a suspected act of terrorism. Uh, so everybody that's involved with this scene now, uh, there are very specific things that have to be done here. There has to be a criminal investigation. We have to control the property side of things, which is usually fire. We have to control the life life side of things, which is usually EMS, um, and, and so on and so forth. So that unified command takes and puts multiple uh, commanders kind of in, in place that they work together. So maybe the EMS commander, the fire commander, and the law enforcement commander all kind of work together. You know, an, an example of this is uh, the system that I, uh, I worked 911 for. Um, you know, oftentimes we'd have these these incidents in which we'd respond out, and and we were separate from fire, and so fire would respond out, law enforcement would respond out. And when I would get on scene, in most cases, I would I would check in with uh, whoever was was uh, kind of leading up fire and who was leading law enforcement. And say, okay, here's my thoughts, here's my concerns. I'd tell the the, the on duty fire uh, commander that, okay, here's the situation. We have, you know, three people trapped. Here's the most critical. That's the one I want you to get out. I don't care how you do it. That's up to you because that's your, that's your game. Uh, but here's the one that, from a medical standpoint, needs to go. We may have finance and administration, so larger scale incidents. So things like, you know, the things that people are on scene for days and, and, and weeks even, um, you know, for example, 2000, uh, 2001, uh, September 11, 2001, such a large-scale incident. I mean, there was there was months and months and months of a rescue operation going on uh, that then turned into you know a recovery operation before they even started to think about stepping forward and uh, starting to clean the mess up. So finance and administration, they're overseeing, they're accounting for man hours for materials uh, because somebody's going to have to pay for that. Somewhere uh, there's going to be reimbursement hopefully for all that overtime that those people put in or for all those supplies that were used, for those fire trucks that were destroyed, whatever. Logistics. We have to have the essential supplies during our response. So maybe we need more bandages. We need more oxygen. We need more backboards. Logistics is going to oversee where we're going to get that equipment. Maybe they're going to tell incoming units, uh, pull up, drop all your backboards, um, and then proceed to the staging area. Operations, triage, treatment, transport of our patients. That's what, again, our biggest concerns are. Planning. So we analyze the data collected from the response, and we can make recommendations how we're going to do this better in the future. So uh, planning often gets overlooked, but it's it's critical. It's very very critical aspect here, because if we're not planning, if we're not watching, uh, if we're not looking to improve, uh, there's always the chance that we're going to have a, a similar incident, and it's going to go just as poorly. All right. So when you're on scene. We need to estimate the number of patients and the resources that we're going to need at the scene. And we pass that information on early in the process. By passing that information on early in the process, we get more resources there as soon as possible. So as an advanced EMT, you will generally be assigned to either triage, treatment, or transport. And then in ICS, that's a specialization of resources to prevent duplication of efforts while maximizing resource capabilities. So in this case, we're saying maybe, uh, you know, Bill, Bob, and Joe, you guys are assigned to transport, and, uh, you know, Mary, 
Eva and Anna uh, are assigned to triage, and, you know, and the next three people are assigned to treatment. So we don't have people just doing whatever they think they need to have done. There's usually some sort of a plan in place. Somebody has a plan. Okay, here's how we're going to get these people transported. The next ambulance to come in is going to take these people. And the next people who come in are going to go do this. The people just kind of freelance and do whatever they think they, they should. You know, they just show up uh, and start doing whatever. It can actually mess the system up. The next two are a couple of videos you can watch from the, uh, the non-narrated PowerPoints. Triage. Triage is a French word for the sorting of the casualties. Um, and uh, this allows us to prioritize our treatment. It's a quick sorting process. Optimize a short amount of time. Uh, we have we have rep uh, triage is an ongoing process. So this ongoing process, we have primary triage, which the very first EMS provider that comes across them assigns them that category, um, and they get their prior their primary triage where they're basically sorted into one of four significant groups. Secondary triage, once they get to the treatment area, they're reevaluated and reassessed. And usually they're constantly reevaluated and reassessed. People generally can get worse, but don't generally get better on the scene. So an example of a triage tag, hopefully this is not something that you uh, have never seen before. You can also see this on 760 in your text. Uh, the things to keep in mind about this triage tag is uh, if it's colored, um, significantly colored, it's probably tear off. So the green tab, the yellow tab, the red tab, uh, and then the two yellow corners up on the top are uh, perforated for you to rip parts off. So, um, and your, your colored tabs, your priority tabs down at the bottom, are intended for you to be able to, to make people worse. So if they started out as a green, you can, re, you can leave it all there, but now they get worse and they become a yellow, you tear the green tab off, and they get worse and they become a red, you tear the red tab or the yellow tab off, um, you know, and so on and so forth. The other things are those two yellow corners up the top, one of them can be torn off and kept in the ambulance that actually transported the patient. Um, and then the other one can be torn off and left at the hospital where the patient went to. You note that they are all um, they are all uh, numbered, serial numbered. They have that F three four eight eight zero seven on there, so people can then go back in the long run and, and kind of piece together how did that patient get from point A to point B. So our primary triage categories that we talk about: we have immediate, we have expectant, we have delayed. We have minor. So when we say expectant, um, that all often uh, is a little confusing. So expectant actually means uh, dead or on their way to dead. Uh, immediate is the red. Uh, the, these people have life-threatening injuries that require immediate attention and transport. Expectant, they're dead or have injuries that will make them dead here very, very soon. We have delayed. Uh, they don't require immediate attention, but need to be seen as soon as possible. And that's the yellows. And we have minor, the greens, require little to no care, also sometimes called the walking wounded. So in almost all cases, we have this color system. The color systems almost always match, um, where we have red, yellow, green, and black. Uh, we're generally hanging on an extremity. You could hang it from their toe. You could hang it around their neck. The, uh, they usually come with string long enough you can put around the patient's neck. Uh, triage is not usually performed alone. <laughs> However, the primary triage may. Uh, it may be one of those things that uh, you have to get through. You have to sort through these people quickly um, and get them categorized. And then usually it's subsequent um, triages or secondary triages that will then go back and maybe be done uh, with a few more people uh, participating. Um, documentation is critical, yet it's not often done uh, immediately. That's why we use these number systems. Um, so you may not know what that patient's name is, but you can say, okay, I'm in ambulance four, and I'm taking patient F348807. And so there's, there's a tracking mechanism that says, okay, we know that that guy's gone down the line. 
Um, we're going to try to gather information and put it on the triage tag. You know, you can put male or female, their name if possible. You know where their address is. That's great. Um, and any medical information we may gather, if we've gathered some vital signs, that can be documented on there. Maybe we note some specific wounds on there. So here's how the start triage system works. This tends to be the most commonly used uh, triage system uh, as of today. So basically, you start out by gathering your walking wound. So you may show up on scene and say, if you can get up and walk, walk over here and sit down by the, this big tree or get up and walk over there and sit down by that yellow fire truck. Um, that automatically took all your greens, moved them to one spot. Now, is that to say that they maybe don't have a little bit worse injury? No. But that very quickly got the people who don't need immediate attention out of our way. As then we then start to approach the patients who didn't go anywhere, we'll walk up to them, look for any respiration, if we see respiration, great. Um, if we don't, then we have to do uh, we have to do something. So we'll open their airway, do a manual, uh, uh, usually jaw thrust in most cases. But so do a, a manual opening of the airway. If they begin to breathe on their own, great. They're red. We don't need to go any further. They're red. Um, if they don't breathe on their own, they're black. They're dead. So those that were breathing spontaneously as we approach them, we then say, okay, what is their rate? Is it over 30? Then if it's over 30, they're red. Is it under 30? Okay, we're going to keep looking. So then we move from respiration to perfusion. And with perfusion, so their breathing is under 30 per minute, but yet they are breathing, uh, we'll assess their radial pulse. Uh, do they have an absent radial pulse or a delayed cap refill? They are red. And then we need to consider controlling their bleeding, if they have any. If they have a radial pulse present uh, and their cap or their cap refill is within normal limits, we check their mental status. Check the mental status. If they can follow simple commands, they're delayed. They're yellow. If they cannot follow any simple commands, they're red. So. Respirations, uh, they, they like to call this RPM. Respirations, perfusion, mental status. So it's very commonly accepted form, prioritizes for treatment and transport. Step one, individual who can follow the command is placed on the lowest treatment priority. Get up and walk over here, green. Two, check for adequate breathing categorize as appropriately based on those results. Step three, determine their ventilatory rate and their level of perfusion. Step four, assess their mental status. Their initial triage is not the time for interventions. So besides maybe handing, handing them something to control their own bleeding um, or maybe putting in an oral airway, um, that's the, really the extent of anything we're going to be doing. Uh, there's there's some discussion on maybe tourniquet should be involved. Um, currently, not uh, it's not a standard yet, but it, it very well could be. And then expect the patient to change. Jump start, on the other hand, is what is used in the pediatric population. So jump start triage um, it takes into account some of those differences between adults and pediatrics, and it uses kind of the the start model but it alters it just a little bit. So jump start uh, is based on, uh, still on RPM. Oops. And if you look at page 762, you'll see an example of this. And it's basically much the same way. So if you're able to get up and walk, walk over here, lay down by this yellow fire truck, you're green. You go to breathing or respirations, okay, breathing. Um, we're going to, if they're not breathing, open their airway. Um, if they begin to breathe, they're immediate. If they're apneic, then we're going to check for a palpable pulse because we know that kids with a, uh, uh, kids have stronger hearts, weaker lungs. So if they have a pulse, uh, or if they have no pulse, they're dead, black. If they do have a pulse, we'll give them five quick rescue breaths. 
they begin to breathe on their own, they're red. If they don't breathe on their own, they're black. Then we'll move on. Uh, if they're breathing on their own when we approach them, the respiratory rate is is less than 15 or more than 45, they're red. If it's within the range of 15 to 45, we go to pulse. They have no palpable pulse, they're red. If they do have a palpable pulse, we go to AVPU or mental status. Um, so if they have a P or a U, uh, and that, so P inappropriate such as uh, posturing, um, they are a red. Or if they have, uh, they're responsive to they're alert, responsive to verb, verbal, or they respond appropriately to painful, then they are a yellow. Let me show an example of a field treatment area. They've set this up, and this actually to me looks more like it's a kind of a health clinic, but anyway, gives you an idea. Treatment. Uh, don't start treatment until the patient has gone through triage. Uh, we're probably not going to put bunches and bunches of splints on everybody and give everybody bunches of medications and everybody gets an IV and everybody gets this. It's probably very, very basic stuff to hold them off, get them to the hospital where there's more hands and more resources. So based on the time of, uh, of treatment on scene, uh, it's going to dictate how much actually gets done. If this is somebody we can get moved to the hospital quickly, probably not a lot going to be done. Don't forget that we're overwhelmed on the scene. They're going to be overwhelmed at the hospital as well. And then some illnesses or injuries are going to require specialized care. So do we direct them to a birthing center? Do we direct them to a stroke center? Do we direct them to a trauma center, um, MI, a cardiac center, so on and so forth? All right, so as an advanced EMT, you're going to be participating uh, in the aspects of this trauma system key element in the trauma system is prevention and education and advocacy because it's best if we don't ever have to have to lay hands on a trauma patient. At some point in your career you will participate in a multiple casualty incident. It may not be a hundred patients, it may only be five, but you'll eventually get there. Um, establishing command is the first step. After command we start the triage process using either the start or the jump start or whatever is you know the the approved triage system for that system. Um, we determine number of patients and their acuity. Remember, your response is going to be very stressful. You're going to be wiped after this is done. And you need to remain focused uh, and on task uh, in order to provide the greatest chance of survival for the greatest number of patients. Remember, that's what it's all about. Do the best for the most.